So our next subject is value, utility, and price. And I'll talk certainly about all of these things. Uh, so the point uh, of the lecture will be to give you an introduction into uh, uh, Austrian price theory. Uh, the importance of the subject is clear in that uh, prices are the heart of, uh, of the market economy. So if there's one thing characteristic of, uh, of a market economy, it's the fact that there are prices being paid and, and received. It's precisely this fact that makes a market economy aesthetically and or morally uh, unacceptable for certain sensitive souls, uh, in particular the labor market, right? And, uh, always, there's still some people left uh, who the, then snap, snap and say, well, labor is not a commodity. Uh, well, sorry. I mean, the, the price is being paid for labor performed. And as soon as such an exchange takes place, we have a price. Uh, so there is certainly a commodity character, or certainly in some respects, and at least labor must be similar to uh, tomatoes and oranges and so on, whereas it's certainly not in all respects, but that's a different matter. So we, uh, prices are certainly uh, the, the heart of, uh, of, economic, uh, of, of the market economy, and price theory then is at the heart of uh, economic theory. Um, prices have uh, traditionally uh, uh, being explained, so what is uh, the, the cause of, of prices? In the Austrians are famous for uh, the approach, as they say, they belong to the marginal uh, utility or marginal value schools, right? So they explain uh, market prices in terms of a more general, of an underlying reality that they call value. Right? So value then is the cause of price. And within the neoclassical camp, the structure of the argument is the same. Here we would say that utility is the, ex is the, the cause underlying prices. Now, this is not something that started only in the 1870s with what is called the marginalist revolution, right? Menga, Jevons, and Walras. It goes back much further in time. Uh, actually, so the insight that market prices or the value of things, uh, the market price of things, might have something to do with utility right, or subjective value of the, of the market participants, uh, th that was already present in the Middle Ages. Right? You find, for example, in the work of, of Thomas Aquinas, uh, various other scholastics. Right? It survived throughout the 16th and 17th century in the works of the late scholastics, right? in particular in the works of what has been called the School of Salamanca. And here in this, in the, some writers of this school actually uh, identified the principle of marginal valuation, valuation right? So they anticipated the, the marginal, marginalist revolution that then set in in the 1870s. The reason why such a revolution was necessary was because there was no con continuity from the school of Salamanca down to Karl Menger, Jevons, and Walras in 1870. Uh, but there was something in between, and the something in between is called the school of classical economists. <laughs> classical economists. Or classical economics. So the classical economists, who were they? In particular, Adam Smith, uh, Malthus, David Ricardo, Jean-Baptiste Say, okay. And uh, the classical economists, they deviated from this approach to explain prices in terms of an underlying of their utility for human beings mm -hmm. in arguing that uh, market prices result um, from the cost of production, okay. So the fact, for example, that this pen might sell for 10 coronas uh, here in Denmark, derives or is explained by the fact that it costs, well, 10 coronas minus profit to produce the pen. Okay, so that's the reason. 
It cannot be sold for less because then the entrepreneur would make a loss. It will not be sold for, for more, sold for more because then competition would set in and drive down the price toward this price of 10 coronas. Okay, so that was the argument of the classical economists. Um, the main problem in this explanation, or in the cost of uh, production explanation, is circularity. Okay, so if it's really the cost of production that explain the price of the pen, well, where do these costs of production come from? Okay. Uh, what, what, where does the value, you may say, the cost of production for this is I have to pay so and so many people, uh, workers to produce the pens, materials needed to produce the pen. But then the question is, of course, well, uh, how are the prices that I pay to these guys are in turn determined? Okay, how are the prices that I pay for the plastic and for the color and so on that I use uh, to make the pen, how are these determined? How are the prices for the labor? Uh, uh, determine and so on. So you, you move back ever more and ultimately you start explaining one thing in terms of, uh, of another thing and you end up with a circular, circular explanation. That's the big problem in, uh, in the cost of production approach. So even the classical economists and in particular Jean-Baptiste Say never abandoned the, the notion, but David Ricardo as well, uh, that the ultimate foundation for prices is to be found in utility, uh, that is in the cr contribution that the uh, object under consideration makes to human welfare. But they could not explain how this link would, would work out. And in particular, they could not do this because uh, they uh, 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 believed that there was a paradox, what has been uh, later on called the classical paradox of value. Uh, can be stated very quickly in the following way. I mean, utility cannot be the explanation for uh, market prices because there are certain objects that have a very high utility for human life, such as water, right, that command a very low price. Without water, we could not survive. So water is essentially, is vitally important for human life. Uh, but we pay very, very low prices for water, and usually we don't pay uh, prices for water at all. And in many areas of the world, we still pay no prices for water at all. On the other hand, there are objects like diamonds, uh, which have certainly a utility, but a utility that as compared to water uh, is not very high. And still, it is the case that we pay very high prices for diamonds, uh, a tiny diamond you have to work a year or two uh, to buy it on the market. So this was the classical paradox, paradox of value, also sometimes called the diamond water paradox, right? because in fact these two examples that I've used are the most widely used examples to illustrate the paradox. Now the solution to this paradox uh, is to be found in the principle of marginal value, and here the emphasis is on marginal. Um, and this brings us then to, uh, to Menga's approach, which in this respect, as far as marginality is concerned, the principle of marginal uh, price deter determination, uh, has the same structural features as the theories of Jevons and Varas. So what Menga said, the same thing, same th observation that Jevons made, was that we get the paradox of value because we reason in terms of classes, of entire classes of goods. Okay? You see, water in general uh, has a higher utility than diamonds in general. And as a consequence, we get the paradox because the price of water is much lower than the price of diamonds. Um, but in real world situations, in the very situation in which market prices come to be established, right? You go into a shop and so on. You never, you never go to a, a supermarket and say, "Well, I want to buy all the water in the world." Right? Or I never go to a, to, uh, to a jeweler and say, "Well, give me all the diamonds in the world." Right? Apart from the question that he could not sell you all the diamonds because he doesn't own all the diamonds in the world. And right? so, what we always do is we uh, buy and sell concrete units, right? concrete quantities 
limited quantities of the overall supply. And the prices are in fact determined in the light of these individual partial units of the overall supply. And uh, so it comes that certain individual units might have a very low value because our needs are already satisfied uh, by the existing um, by the existing uh, supply. So one way to illustrate this, and this is the way it is usually done in economics classes, is that we say we have here a supply, we have a quantity, and here we have the utility. And this utility is decreasing with the supply. Okay, so this would be the way Jevons and Varas have done this. And what we find in Austrian economics is something very similar, namely that we say every um, unit of a good serves individual or concrete needs. That is, for example, if I have a supply of 10 fish, third fish, and here we have the ten-fifth fish, uh, then every single unit of the supply will be accorded to satisfy an individual concrete need. So the most important use that I might ha have for a fish is to stay alive. Right? So I will eat the fish eat myself, eat the fish myself, right? <laughs> eat the fish myself to stay alive. If I were an altruist, I would say, have my wife eat a fish to stay alive. Well, okay, so let's be realistic. And then the second is, have my wife eat a fish eat a fish, and so on, right? And the, th the, third fish is, the third fish is for the children, and the fourth for the grand grandparents, and the fifth might be for the neighbors, the sixth is for a charitable organization, and then number seven is sold on the market, number eight is a fish that I might eat just for pleasure, number nine would be a fish that I will eat just to stuff myself, right? And number 10 will be a fish that I give my kids to eat for pleasure and so on, right? So we have different uses of the concrete units, right? And the point is that um, they, uh, in, in, in making my choices, I select the most important uses that I can uh, make of the object under consideration, right? So if I have just one fish, I will use, uh, uh, allocate this fish to the most important use. If I have two fish, I will allocate it to the two most important uses. And this always means that there are various other uses that will not be supplied with. Okay. So it follows then uh, that by the uh, very nature of, uh, of this principle, that every uh, increase of the, of the supply of a homogeneous good that I might have will lead to less important needs being satisfied. Okay. Now we can express this in a curve such as this, or, or rather, right, we would have uh, discrete and concrete dots, right? no continuous thing, because, well, in the case of fish I might subdivide it and so on. Okay if you're a good fish cutter. Uh, but, so we have a very similar principle here, right? but there's one important difference as compared to Jevons and Varas, and that's the difference that we need to talk about now. Namely, what Jevons and Varas uh, stress here is this reality of utility. That is that they say an increase in the quantity of a good consumed will lead 
to a lesser satisfaction. Okay? And this satisfaction is conceived to be something uh, 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 psychological. Okay? I'm very thirsty. I drink the first beer. I'm satisfied. I'm happy. I drink the second beer. I'm a little less satisfied. I drink the 17th beer. I'm completely drunk. And so we have something like this, right? In quantity increases, and then at some point the utility, that is the satisfaction, the psychological feeling of wellness and so on that we derive from it, becomes negative. Right? Now that's very different from, uh, from this, right? because uh, uh, what we here have is a psychological account of uh, the phenomenon of, of marginal utility or marginal value, whereas here we have a praxeological account. Right? Here the, the, the point of the argument is to say, because of the, by the very nature of things being uh, able, uh, liable to be subdivided in discrete units, every increase in the quantity will lead to the satisfaction of a want that is less important than the ones that have been uh, satisfied so far. What's the demonstration or what is uh, the, the proof of this? Well, the proof of this is that the very fact that I choose to allocate uh, the good, uh, the two goods to, uh, to these uh, two, two users, eat the fish myself and then have my wife eat a fish, proves that they are the most important users. Right? I prove it through action. It's, it's a demonstrated preference, if you wish. Okay. And by the very fact, I prove that all these other uses are less important than the ones that I have selected. So we have here a principle at work that Rothbard has called the principle of demonstrated preference. And we have a praxeological law. Praxeological law. Whereas here in the jevons varas account, we have a psychological law. Now what is this just, uh, are these not just different ways of saying the same thing? Well, there are distinct advantages to the praxeological approach. Uh, the first one is, that, I mean, it is realistic. It is realistic that in any given situation we make choices. These choices are always, always taking place in a certain context. And in making choices and preferring certain things, we at the same time renounce to other things. Okay? In selecting these two uh, uses of, of my fish supply, uh, I automatically re renounce to all other alternatives that I've, I could have chosen instead. Right? And that is uh, the basis for the, the principle of diminishing marginal value. Um, in the psychological account, the, uh, the thing is much less clear. Uh, in fact, we have here two, uh, two main problems. The first one is there is no unit of one satisfaction that could be generalized um, for different commodities, certainly, but even uh, within one class of commodities. right? Um, and say, the pleasure that I derive from drinking beer is very different from the pleasure that I derive from, let's say, dance lessons, right? or from the pleasure of listening to piano concerts, uh, or of eating a piece of bread. Right? So how are we to say, well, this is the same unit of utility? Well, what's the empirical basis for making such an, uh, such an assertion? There is none. Okay? So econ in economic textbooks, sometimes we still have the use of the word Util, right? So it's a basic unit of utility, but this util is completely fictitious. It's not something that can be really observed. Right? And the second problem that we have in the psychological account is that the story is not always as clear cut as this. There might be cases in which the pleasure that I derive from a good actually increases with increased consumption. For example, uh, I might at first be offended by a certain type of music. ACDC, 
Right? And then the more I get to listen and yeah, find some pleasure, maybe it's not very high, but might be, might be higher than, than zero. But as, as soon, so the point is that as soon as we have something like this, right, we could no longer say that there is a strict general law that you know, the marginal utility always decreases with an increasing quantity. We get a, something completely different, right? it's a completely different result which affects our price theory. Whereas from the praxeological point of view, we always have diminishing marginal value as the quantity uh, increases. Okay. So why did uh, Jevons and Varas um, choose the psychological account? Uh, there are various speculations uh, about this. I think the most plausible explanation is that this account lends itself much more easily to mathematical formalizing. And that is for the following reason. In, uh, if you have this account, then you have value or utility is by and large is a, um, a two-sided relationship. Right? We have a man, now in the general sense, right, men and women, and we have uh, uh, his satisfaction. And we have the quantity of a good. Right. And if we assume uh, that the dimension of the satisfaction is the same for one man as far as all goods are concerned, so that there is a basic util unit underlying any satisfaction that I might uh, derive from piano concerts and so on, uh, attending lectures and so on, all this is basically a same unit of satisfaction, um, then I get a common denominator for all these goods Okay, get a common denominator for all these goods, and I can write a nice equation that gives me the equilibrium condition that is the condition that should hold in the situation that is optimal for my decision making, namely that The price of good, the relationship between the price for good one and the utility that I derive from good one is the same as the relationship between the price that I pay for good two and the price, the utility that I derive from good two. And it's the same as the utility that I derive from good three and the, the price that I pay for it, and so on and so on. Right? Graphically, we can express this in the following way. It's the so-called second law of Gossen. We have here the utility of one, utility two, utility three, and here we have the quantity of uh, one, quantity two, quantity three. And now we, have, we might have different utility curves here. So, and so. Right. And in equilibrium, the marginal utility that I uh, derive from all, any good should be exactly the same as the marginal utility that I derive from any other good. Right? So let's say if this is my budget line, then I should consume in equilibrium this quantity of good one, and this quantity of good two, and this quantity of good three. Right? If I consumed a, a greater quantity of good one, this means because things are scarce that I consume, could consume only a lesser quantity of any of the other goods. But this would mean that my marginal utility is lower for this good right, than the marginal utility that I would derive from any other of the other goods. So I would not be in equilibrium. I would have excessive consumption of one and deficient consumption of some of the other goods. So in order to equalize, uh, uh, the marginal utilities and therefore maximize overall utility, I have to take care that the, uh, 
the marginal utilities are the same for all goods. Now this is all, this is all very nice. Uh, you give, can give a nice uh, graphical presentation and uh, we can formulate the, the equilibrium condition in, in an equation uh, which makes very sophisticated right, and scientific. But the problem is, as I've said, that it's based on a fictitious stipulation. If we make the uh, uh, stipulation, without this stipulation, we could not draw up these all graphs. We could not draw, uh, draw up this equation. I think as soon as we admit that these might be different units here, completely, completely incomparable units, right, uh, the equation no longer holds. Right. So that's my hypothesis then, that the reason why Jevons and Walras who certainly had an interest in applying mathematics to social phenomena because that was the way they conceived the progress of science to be. They made this fictitious stipulation because it alone helped them to, to do what they wanted to do, namely apply mathematics for the description of social phenomena. Now things are very different in the, the, the Mengarian approach. What Menga does, so we have not these two-sided relationship Man's satisfaction than the quantity of a good. Uh, this, this homogeneous blob, man's satisfaction is all the same. So what we have in Menga is in fact a trilateral relationship. Uh, we have man, we have alternative one, one and we have alternative alternative two uh, both alternatives are related to uh, uh, ends that the acting person pursues but he has to make up his mind between them he can choose either one or the other one now, um, so this way of conceiving of value, right? The, the value is in fact the relationship between uh, the two, the choice alternatives, for a given individual in a specific historical concrete context. Okay, that is what value is. Uh, it's a relate. It's not a unit. It's not a substance, a fictitious substance. It is a relationship between value alter uh, choice alternatives. And it necessarily, therefore, varies from one context to another. Right? So it makes no sense to assume that it could be given a, a common, uh, has a common uh, basic unit. There is no such thing. Rather, it varies re really from context to context. It cannot be, therefore, expressed in such an equation, at least not in this equation, which is the foundation of uh, modern, mm -hmm. as, until the present day, uh, neoclassical price theory. So, let me then, after having explained these differences between Menga's approach and Jevons and Walras's approach, let me go, let me em emphasize some things in more detail. So uh, Menga, in his value theory, he stresses first of all that we need to make fundamentally the distinction between economic goods uh, and goods in general. Right? Value, uh, the phenomenon that we need to explain prices, applies only, it can exist only in the case of economic goods. Right? A good in general would be, for example, sunshine. Right? Helps things to grow, makes human beings happy and so on, but it is not an economic good. Uh, why is this? Uh, uh, essentially because um, sunshine cannot be controlled, right? It cannot be owned by, by human beings. So it cannot be uh, uh, a means for human action. Right? So we have here one condition for a thing having value, namely it must be liable to be in private property. Then another good 
uh, in general would be, but not an economic good, would be air. Right? The air that we breathe, oxygen and so on, right, is certainly uh, vitally important for human life, but it's not an economic good in most situations. For example, for example, here in this room, there's enough breathing oxygen available right, uh, that needs, does not need to be economized. We need, don't need to act on behalf of air. Uh, things are completely different if you are in a, in a submarine uh, 100 meters below the, the sea level and so on, and uh, your oxygen supply is running out. Right? Then you have a little problem, and oxygen becomes a uh, scarce good. So we have here uh, the relationship between needs and available supplies. And in, in, in the case of an economic goods, there are always more uses or more needs uh, that we can conceive of than the, uh, the supply of uh, the present, uh, the available supply of the good would help us to, to satisfy. Right? So then we have an economic good. And then what we also would need is uh, perception of this, uh, of the existence of the situation. That is, um, we, we might have certain goods that are in fact uh, uh, true goods and economic goods, but because we don't perceive them uh, to be such, well, uh, there are no, uh, no, no economic goods uh, at all. For example, uh, take the case of uranium. Right? Because before the discovery of um, uh, 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 of nuclear power technology, right? there were no uses available for uranium, and right? people knew it existed, but uh, uh, no uses were available for it. Right? So the available supply surpassed any uses that could be made of it, so it was not even a good. Right? Uh, after the discovery of this new technology, suddenly the uh, possible uses for it exceeded the available supply, uh, and that was because suddenly people perceived this uh, physical object, uranium, as an economic good, as, as a good. So we need to have perception of the reality as one constitutive part, uh, essential characteristic of an economic good. And um, so one of the things that Karl Menger then did in his Principles of Economics was to state the, these conditions, explain uh, very uh, clearly. So we have the distinction between economic goods and goods, and then economic goods can have value only if they, be, if they are perceived and if they can be privately owned, that is, if they can be controlled by individuals. And then he explained that... Um, uh, we have this uh, regularity that I discussed before, that is, we have the praxeological derivation of uh, the law of diminishing marginal value. Which is, as I've said, a praxeological law. Okay, so how do we get from there to um, the explanation of market prices? That was, after all, our initial uh, purpose. Therefore, we, we became interested in, in value theory and so on. And uh, the way to, to do this deduction is to start with a, a simple case. Let's return to our example that we, before we had Paul and Peter and the Apple Pear exchange. So we observe Paul is giving his apple to Peter, and Peter is giving his pear to Paul. What is taking place here, and how far does our value theory help us account for this observation? Well, what we would say in this case is that Paul has a value scale that is for, for Paul in the given context, 
uh, the two goods under consideration stand in a value relationship. Right? You would say that the apple is more important than the pear. Now that's a, a writing convention. If you write two objects uh, below one another, above one another, we mean that the higher object has a higher value. So the apple for Paul, or sorry, the pear for Paul, has a higher value than the apple And the apple for Peter has a higher value than the pear. And then there's another writing convention is that we say, well, uh, Paul, he has the apple, he does not have the pear, so we put the pear into brackets. And Peter has the pear, he does not have the apple, so we put the apple into brackets. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if we have such a situation, so that is the condition that must be given for a market price to exchange. Right, so two conditions, we have private property, right, of course, in, in, the, in the two objects exchanged. And we have inverse value scales. Right? This, is, this is an inverse ranking of uh, the goods under consideration. Right? Bo both Paul and Peter value apple and pear, but their valuations are exactly the opposite. For Paul, the, the pear is more important than the apple, and for Peter, the uh, the apple is more important than the pear. So there can be a market exchange, and there will be a market exchange if both of them perceive uh, the situation. Right? And how does this come about, this perception? Well, usually, uh, for example, uh, if, if they show up at the marketplace or they just ask one another, hey, Paul, do you want to give me your, your apple? And then there's an answer, yes or no, and then you have a perception of a reality. Right? You say, yes, give me your pear. And so we have this market exchange coming about. Now, what is uh, the general lesson that we can derive from this? Well, uh, the lesson that we derive from this here is that market prices are based always on, um, not on value equality, right? We do not exchange things that are of equal value, but things that have different value. And these values, the value differences must, in, uh, on top of this, be inverse for the two market participants. Okay. Now that is important uh, uh, if we keep in mind that from Aristotle to Karl Marx and even beyond Karl Marx, there have always been more or less smart thinkers who held that value was ultimately an expression of equality. Right? The, thing, the fact that things are being exchanged on the market demonstrates their equality from the point of view uh, of the acting person. Right? So even somebody like uh, Jean-Baptiste Say, he still held this. And even if you read him, sometimes even today by my good friend Pascal Salin in France, he still would say that market exchanges some, somehow express value equality. And does this, of course, in a metaphorical sense, but right, it lends itself to this confusion. Uh, so the point is, market exchanges always come about because there are differences in value, uh, value and differences in valuations. Okay, now we have a little time to go into the details of pricing. So here we have a market price emerging on the market, and the market price is the relationship between the apple and the pear. One apple is again exchanged against one pear, or one pear against one, one apple. We can write this in the following way. That is the market price. Okay. Now, these situations in which consumer goods are exchanged against one another are called barter exchanges. And barter exchanges are not very important empirically. Right? All civilizations that we know, and I say all civil civilizations that we know of historically, have been monetary economies. Right? Even if we go back to the earliest records that we have, there is no civilization that did not use money. So we have uh, the uh, uh, um, we have uh, the use of uh, of money in, in exchanges, and uh, well, let's use this for our example here and set up a value scale for an individual. 
that say let's owns fish, right? And for this individual in cons uh, under consideration, let's say he has a stock of 10 fish. Now the totality of these 10 fish is for him more important than the totality of total supply of nine fish, okay? And the total supply of nine fish is more important than the total supply of eight fish, of seven fish, of six fish, five, and so on, until one fish. And the one fish that he has is more important to him than the second fish that he could acquire but has not yet, and more important than the third fish that he could acquire but has not yet, and so on. Right? So we have a, a value scale that holds true, mutatis mutandis, for every single good. Okay. Now, if we have a market exchange, uh, we need to plug in some other good that could be exchanged for the fish into this value scale. And let's uh, say here, so we uh, take um, uh, six coronas, I say 100, 100 coronas. Well, what's the abbreviation for coronas? Is this K, KR? K? KR. 100 coronas. Okay, so these, this object, right, the, the individual quantity of 100 coronas is for this individual, uh, let's say that's Paul, is for Paul, 100 coronas that he does not have is for him more important than six fish and five fish and so on and so on and so on, but less important than the total supply of seven fish, eight fish, nine fish, ten fish, and so on. Okay. Now Paul is going to deal with Peter on the market, and for Peter is of course the same thing. Peter has a value scale that is as follows. Ten fish, which he does not have, is more important than nine fish. It's more important than eight fish. Seven fish. Six fish. Uh, five fish, four, and so on, so on, so on. And he does not own fish, but he wants to buy fish. But he does have corona, so he has a, a, a banknote, 100 coronas, and let's say the 100 coronas we're ranking here in his value scale. Now the question is, under, under these conditions, would there be a market exchange right, between the two market participants, uh, Paul and Peter? And the answer is, there would be no exchange, right? because for Peter, uh, in order to uh, to incite him to give up his 100 uh, coronas, one would have to offer him at least 9 fish, or 10 fish, and so on. Right? But Paul, who is a fish owner, will not give him this amount of fish for 100 corona uh, bill, because anything bigger than, uh, anything upward from uh, 7 fish is more important to him than, uh, than the 100 coronas. Okay. So an exchange, a market exchange, will only take place if the value scales are somewhat different. For example, if we have the 100 coronas here. Right? In this case, Peter would give up his 100 coronas to obtain six fish, and Paul would, in fact, give up six fish to obtain the ticket of 100 coronas. Okay. So in this case, then, we would have a market exchange uh, that results from these uh, value scales, 
And it would, in fact, be uh, now accidentally, because of, uh, of my example, would be uh, exactly determined. So the market price that would obtain on the market is 100 coronas for six fish. OK. Now we can construe other examples that uh, might be empirically also relevant in other cases. For example, Peter's value scale might be such that the 100 coronas rank here. So in this case, there are three different market prices that could be established. The 100 coronas could be exchanged against six fish, against five fish, or against four fish. Right? Our uh, analysis of this, of this process does not allow us to give the concrete determination. Right? So here, other particular circumstances uh, would come into play, like psychology and so on, about which uh, we, we cannot say anything. Right? We have no theory that would explain us the concrete price that would emerge under such situ situations. So we help ourselves with an intellectual shortcut we say then that the concrete price would be determined by the bargaining abilities of the two individuals, right? Which is an intellectual shortcut because we have not explained anything, right? We say, okay, the price will be determined by something that we don't know anything about. And we call this something bargaining abilities, okay? But still, the theory is not valueless, even in this case, because we have upper and lower boundaries within which the price must necessarily be established. And about these boundaries or limits of the pricing process, our theory informs us. Right? So the theory tells us that there will be a, a, a maximum price and a minimum price above which and below which the price cannot go or fall. Okay. Now the, the whole picture gets even more involved and complicated if we bring in additional buyers and sellers. Okay. And I won't do this now because already I have problems drawing up the value scales for two individuals here, but to make the sh a long story short, the result is that as you bring ever more people into the picture, there are two modifications. One is that we have something like arbitrage. Right? We might imagine two other individuals, uh, Mary and, and Elizabeth, exchanging, and let's say their value scales were, were such that the price would be at 100 coronas for 9 fish or for 10 fish, okay? So there, then we would have two different prices and, and clearly uh, this cannot be in the interest of, um, uh, uh, of Peter, who is, is the corona owner, to pay 100 coronas to get a comparatively shabby small amount of fish from his uh, partner Paul, but he would rather go to one of the girls and get for 100 coronas, get a higher price. So he would bid down uh, the price that is paid on, on the female market, right? And uh, as a consequence, there would be an overall equilibrium price emerge for the total market. Now, the second observation here is that, uh, that uh, the more market participants we bring into the picture, the more people uh, we bring into the picture, the more finely determined will the price be. Right? The more people there are, uh, involved, the more exactly we can, with the mere help of our economic analysis, determine what the market price will be. And then irrespective of the, of the number of market participants, the theory always tells us about boundaries. It tells us about upper limits and lower limits. And Austrians call these upper limits and lower limits, they say that these limits are determined by the so-called marginal buyers and sellers, okay, by the the upper limit is determined by uh, the buyer who is still ready to pay this high price. The lower limit is determined by the, uh, the seller who is still ready to sell at this low price. Okay. So here we have then, again, right, we have a realistic uh, description of, um, of the pricing process. We don't rely on fictitious postulates, right? The argument relies on the mere fact that we do make choices, 
right? that in making choices we are setting aside, we are preferring things and setting other things aside. So there's a value ranking, a value scale between the different choice alternatives. Right? And then this concerns not only individual action outside of a social context, but it also concerns human action within a social context, in particular in a market context. A market context, then we have uh, market prices emerging if, the, emerging if the valuations are inverse. Right? And we have a determination, a more or less fine determination of the concrete market price, not in the way that we could fix a particular point at which the price has to be established, but in that we can fix boundaries. And the boundaries are more or less narrow. Right? We know that the boundaries are more or less narrow the more market participants come into play. Right? They get ever more narrow the more market participants come into play. Okay, I'll leave it at this, and we'll give you a few minutes for questions. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, as long as the common participants in the market, as you said, the price get more narrow, does it get as well cheaper? I mean, does the boundary get slower, more participants in the uh, Not necessarily. For example, let's, let's imagine here we could construe an example in which the... Um, <coughs> The boundaries are extremely wide. Let's say the 100 coronas would be here. Okay. Then the price could be anything between 9 and 4. Now let's assume this guy is a very good bargainer. So he actually he, um, he gets 9 fish for his 100 coronas. Okay. Then, um, oh, no, wait. In order to answer your question, I need to make the other assumption. This guy is a very good bargainer. So in order to get the 100 coronas, he just pays 4 fish. Okay. Now it might be, if other market participants come into play, that the price will actually increase. Right? Let's, uh, let's say there's a second buyer that comes, into, um, that comes into play, let's say Mary. And Mary, so he has all the uh, same value scale, and her, um, her 100 coronas would be here. So she would be ready to pay any price in between, um, uh, ready to buy 400 coronas between six and nine fish. Okay. Um, so that means that the uh, that the price in this case would go up as a consequence of the appearance of this additional market participant. It would not stay as low. No, I mean, the, the point of the theory is not to say, well, market prices will go up or, or down. The point of the theory is not to say, well, on the free market, the price will always be low. Right? What the theory says is uh, that the more market participants you have, the finer you have, a, the more um, concrete is the determination of the price, the more exactly can we say where the price will be. Okay? If you have just two market participants, the, the possible... Uh, price or the price, uh, the, the spread within which the price can be established can be very, very large. The more market participants uh, you have, uh, the more narrow the limits become. Does not necessarily mean that the uh, limits will become smaller, okay, f from the point of view of the original two market participants that we considered. The, 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 diff the difference between the lower and the upper price will become smaller, but it's not clear whether the difference will go up or, or down. This Yes. Um, are there any fundamental insights in how the market economy or prices work that you gain from the praxeological approach that you cannot derive from the neoclassical? Well, um, I would say only the praxeological uh, approach gives you a, a scientific explanation of the, uh, of the whole pricing process. Uh, otherwise, as far as the, these other similarities, there are, there are other similar, similarities that exist. Right? If you say the, the supply increases, and there's a, a tendency for the price to decrease uh, as well. Right? So there is certainly a, a common point. Right? So there are uh, uh, common conclusions, but right, only the Austrians have given a correct... So you claim that the methodology is superior, but the results are the same? You arrive at the same conclusions with different arguments. Right? And of course, the point in science is always to give the, re the right reasons. Right? If you don't have the right reasons, you can, by, by chance, come up with the right con uh, conclusion. Right? I can say, well, I go and swim in the Öresund, and I make this movement. Right? And the reason why I swim is because 
uh, doing this, I'm giving signs to the angels living in the sea. And they come up and, and lift me up. So I might say, OK, this, the conclusion is the same, the, the, the conclusion that we would base on uh, what we know about uh, fluids and so on. Right? But, uh, so the result is the same, but the explanation is very different. Another question? OK, we'll leave it here. You can always come in, in, the, in the pauses and ask me more, and I'll, I'll go on explaining. I'm yours during the weekend. Right? You can bombard me with your questions. And, and as long as I'm here, I'm answering questions. I'll leave then, and then I'm gone away. I won't take telephone calls. Thank you.